In a town built on fame and fortune, a spirit haunts its now empty streets. He was affected by gold fever. It's an addiction to the gold. His presence is felt in the Arctic temperatures, the vicious winds, and the scorching summers. You don't get this weather anywhere else in the country. There's just nothing like it. And legend has it that if you take in the spirit that haunts this town, a deadly curse will befall you. I was sure that if we didn't break the Bodhi curse, that we may possibly all die. Because Bodhi's gripping tale is one of greed, deceit, and murder. What comes around goes around. And if that was the case, then I guess he got it. He was the first casualty. He was beheaded in front of a piece of him and here and a piece of him over there. Perched high on a bluff in the Sierra Nevada mountain range, Bodie, California's estate park, where visitors can step back in time to the lawless days of the gold rush. But this historical landmark is not just a relic of the Wild West. It's also the home of a deadly curse. I know some people in town that uh, are scared to death of going there. I wouldn't take anything from Bodie just because uh, you never know. <laughs> I wouldn't tempt fate. If you take something away from here, it'll give you bad luck. Yeah, I've heard stories where people had to mail stuff back to Bodie. I have gotten mail in my mailbox addressed to Bodie. It was a square nail, and there was no explanation or anything. The curse of Bodie is so unruly that the park has assigned historian and guide Terry Geisinger to help people who believe they are suffering from its grasp. We have letters, lots and lots of letters of a file that's probably four inches thick describing unusual things that happen to people if they take something from Bodie. The stories go on and on. We've heard a lot of things, and it's really sad because some of them are real powerful stories. Probably the most memorable was back a few years when a man approached me. This man was very sincere and very emotional. He wanted to know how he could go about bringing an item back to Bodhi. He went on to tell me that it was a piano that his family had had. They lived in Bishop, California, and his mother played the piano, but they couldn't afford one. And they knew that there was a piano in Bodie, and so they just came up and got it. That was long before it became a state park. Starting from the very moment the family takes the piano, they are plagued by misfortune. Divorce, death, and finally, news of a deadly illness. The sad part of the story was that his daughter had just been diagnosed with leukemia, and it was the last straw. Desperate to break the curse of Bodhi, the man arranges to send the piano back immediately. He was bound and determined to leave the piano in the parking lot if we didn't accept it. He was bringing it back no matter what. Within two weeks, the piano was back. No one knows what happened to the man and his family. There are just too many of these cases for the staff to follow up on. There are periods of time when you get something in four or five things a month. As the former supervisor of Bodie State Park, Brad Sturdivant has his fair share of experiences with the curse. And over time, he realizes that even something as banal as minor car trouble takes on new meaning when you're in Bodie. One curse I can think of, we had a guy working here many years ago, and uh, 
He was leaving for the season. He sends back this little square nail about this long. And he said, my first experience with the curse of Bodie is when I found this square nail in my tire. He had a flat tire going over to the pass. The curse's grasp seems so powerful that even those that don't believe it still obey it. Bodie's curse doesn't require somebody to sort of go all in and say, I believe in curses. And so someone who maybe doesn't see themselves as believing in the supernatural may still, with this idea of a curse, say, I don't remember having such bad luck. Why not just send this material back? Let me just play it safe. Because even the most level-headed people can agree that the story behind this legend is convincing enough to believe it might be real. And many say this curse begins with the town's namesake, W.S. Bodie. Back when this mountainside was nothing but open land. W.S. Bodie was from Poughkeepsie, New York. He was very exceptionally smart, was literate and he was out west trying to um, strike it rich. W.S. Bodie is just one of many trying to find their fortune during this time. The gold rush of 1849, uh, most everybody who was looking for gold ended up in the Bay Area, San Francisco, and places like that where the mining claims had sprung up on the, on the west side of the Sierra. It's an exciting time full of hopes and dreams, chaos and uncertainty and W.S. Bodie is swept up in the moment. He was affected by gold fever. It's an addiction to the gold and an immense amount of hope ingrained in all of us of a better life. After toiling away on the western side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range for nine years, W.S. Bodie realizes most of the mines have been tapped. Historian Nick Goriath believes that this is why he crosses into uncharted territory. Only the very brave would go over to the eastern side of the Sierras because it was life-threatening. But they wanted to discover something. They wanted to make a name for themselves. They, they just had ambition. But even the most ambitious often underestimate the risk that lies on this side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range. The Eastern Sierra fools a lot of people because they come here and they don't expect the extreme weather. Winters are pretty unforgiving. Uh, 20, 30 below zero is pretty normal for wintertime. And with wind chill, you can probably see uh, 50, 60 below zero. Even in the summertime, it can be 90 degrees, but feel like 120 degrees. But none of that matters when there is gold to be found. Weather was never a deterrent for these sturdy prospectors. They would go to the side of the mountains where you would never think that a billy goat would go. And before long, the risky excursion pays off for W.S. Bodie. However, the mountain's weather patterns can change at a moment's notice. And the prospector's luck doesn't hold out for long. Mother Nature sometimes is very unpredictable. W.S. Bodhi never reaped the, the benefits from his discovery. Perched high on a bluff in the Sierra Nevada mountains lies Bodhi, California. Bodhi was built on hopes Dreams, gold, and sweat. Now it's the largest unrestored ghost town in our country and became a state park in 1962. Bodie is also the home of an infamous curse. If you take something from the place, you will pay the consequences. Legend has it that the curse of Bodie dates back to the 19th century when folks had only one thing on their mind. In 1959, the California gold rush is in full swing, and folks are frantic to strike it rich at all costs. This time period was the opening of the West. It gave a reason for the people to come across, and all they could think of was the riches waiting for them. Caught up
up in the excitement of the times, eager prospector W.S. Bodie makes a risky decision. He crosses over to the notorious eastern side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, away from the crowded mines and into a no man's land in search of riches. W.S. Bodie was determined to find his fortune and he wouldn't let anything stand in the way of him going to seek it. Hey boy. Once there, W.S. Bodie partners up with another prospector by the name of E.S. Taylor. He was an experienced miner. They called him Black Taylor because he had dark skin and he was said to be half Cherokee Indian. Which may have put E.S. Taylor in a precarious position. For American Indian people, land is very sacred to who they are and there was a lot of hostility between American Indians and miners mainly because the miners were essentially digging up their sacred sites, their sacred areas, areas that were their homes or their traditional lands for something of monetary value. But this doesn't seem to be a concern for E.S. Taylor, especially since he and W.S. Bodie are on the brink of success. The Eastern Sierra was the new frontier, and it had so much to be discovered, and they were on the front side of it. Both then and now, weather on this side of the mountains can be unpredictable. Meteorologist Brandon Woley can attest to its brutal wrath. They picked that spot really not knowing that they were going to fall a victim to harsh conditions during the summer months and, uh, more importantly, the winter. It wasn't really a good spot for comfort in terms of human life, but for the gold rush, it was perfect. It's not just the harsh living conditions that pose a problem. At this altitude, weather patterns along the coast can make it downright deadly. The Pacific Ocean is a birthplace for a lot of extreme weather. Cold fronts, strong areas of low pressure, and those systems do make their way in throughout Northern California and Northern Nevada, specifically targeting the Sierra region and Bodie. Despite the difficult conditions, W.S. Bodie and his partner E.S. Taylor worked the land all summer in hopes of discovering the mother load. They're out there in knee deep water. Their hands are freezing, bit up by mosquitoes, they're sunburnt, and they're gonna keep on going until they find what they're looking for. <laughs> Being at that high elevation during the summer months and being on a plateau can be very tough on the human body because you're closer to the sun and you're not really protected. You don't have any trees around you or big hills to protect you. Also, you can get dehydrated very quickly because of low relative humidity in the high desert region. The hostile conditions are just one of many issues plaguing these pioneers. W.S. Bodie and E.S. Taylor were in no man's land. The closest town was about 15 miles from where Bodie had the cabin. But the hard living pays off when a discovery is made. They found gold deposits in the streams, and lo and behold, there was enough gold to strike a claim. The men work feverishly to pull all the gold they can before the summer ends. They were not planning on spending the winter in Bodie. The conditions are far too difficult for anyone to really live up there. Still, desperate for more time, W.S. Bodie and E.S. Taylor make one final trip to a nearby town for supplies, hoping to get a few more weeks of mining in before winter hits. From Monaville, it takes two days of hiking to get back to their cabin. And they started out on a bright, sunny day, but the weather is very fickle here. And sometime in the middle of that hike, snow started to fall. And in the blink of an eye, the infamous Eastern Sierra weather descends upon them. These blizzards are very dangerous because the winds are howling and they're complete whiteout. 
And this unexpected storm sets in motion a legendary curse that will haunt this land for generations to come. The weather in Bodhi can be deadly, especially if you're not prepared for it. He couldn't wait any longer. He couldn't hold his friend. He couldn't carry his friend any further. After making the discovery of a lifetime on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, gold miners W.S. Bodie and E.S. Taylor believe a great fortune lies in their future. But they push their luck by staying on the eastern side of the mountain long after they should have left. The weather in this area can be unforgiving. Of course, nowadays folks know what to expect. Weather can be extreme here. When I was in the eighth grade in 1955, it was 52 below zero once, and snow was level with all the fences and very, very severe. But back in 1859, W.S. Bodie and E.S. Taylor have no idea what lies ahead for them once the seasons change. Towards fall and winter, we start to get some unpredictability because of the Pacific being so close to the Sierra Nevada mountain range. Not only do these storms come on strong, they come on fast with little warning. We can get a whiteout condition going in a matter of minutes. And then as the system passes through, a lot of accumulation occurs. And then behind that system, we get some post-frontal winds that could keep the blizzard conditions going for days. The storm comes in quickly, which is usually how they do. If you're not prepared, you can certainly be in a dangerous situation. It's just this sort of treacherous storm that descends on W.S. Bodie and E.S. Taylor in the fall of 1859. They were on their way back to their cabin, and the weather turned, and turned very quickly. They couldn't see where they're going. They were exhausted. These blizzards are very dangerous. And when it's whiteout conditions, it's not only blinding in the distance, you can't see where you're putting your feet down. Legend has it, the two men wander the mountain in search of their cabin for days. Bodie wasn't in very good condition, supposedly. And he had a really hard time making it through the deep snow. Taylor tried carrying him on his shoulders, and he can only go so far. Staring down death, Taylor makes an impossible decision. He figured, well, I, I gotta save myself. So he wrapped him in a blanket, and he was intending to come back to get Bodhi after he could get some rest. And as the legend goes, E.S. Taylor's decision to leave W.S. Bodhi behind lays the foundation for a curse that persists to this very day. I think Taylor probably knew that that was the end of Bodhi when he left him. Once E.S. Taylor makes it back to the cabin, he realizes there's no escaping Winter's wrath and no chance of saving his fallen miner. It starts to snow during the months of October and November, and because of its high elevation, it might snow all the way through the month of May. Which is what happened during the winter of 1859. Abandoned by his partner, W.S. Bodie freezes to death. And it isn't until the snow melts that spring that E.S. Taylor is able to go in search of him. Taylor found Bodie's remains in May of that year. And the cruel irony of W.S. Bodie's location goes down in history. Bodie was not more than a mile away from his cabin. He died on top of his discovery. Who knows what would have happened 
if he would have made it that night. While E.S. Taylor swears he did everything he could for his partner, something about his story doesn't sit right. It seems awful strange that he met this E.S. Taylor and only knew him a month or two, and that he should die three quarters of a mile away from the cabin. You would think that he would have tried harder to get Bodie back. After all, E.S. Taylor stands to gain quite a bit with his partner out of the way. Any time when you have money involved is a breeding ground for greed. Was Black Taylor actually thinking of taking over the claim? That is the great mystery. But what goes around comes around. And this isn't the last that anyone has heard of W.S. Bodie. His legacy will live on in a boom town and its legendary curse. Bodie wanted revenge on Taylor. And Taylor got his just rewards. The California Gold Rush is a time of hope, excitement, ambition, and greed. And many fall prey to the fervor of this era. When desire pushes W.S. Bodie to stay on the eastern side of the Sierra Nevada mountain in search of gold, he suffers deadly consequences. Here he is at the biggest discovery he would ever make, and he died just within months and within sight of his discovery. And many folks wonder if his partner, E.S. Taylor, has played a part in Bodie's untimely demise. He knew where the discovery was. He would have been able to take over the claim and become wealthy himself. There would be quite a lot to gain. Still in search of pay dirt, E.S. Taylor continues to mine the claim, but he maintains a low profile hoping to keep the find under wraps. So he takes on extra work and settles down in a nearby town. The story goes is that Black Taylor was taking care of a ranch and then the livestock for the owner. Since W.S. Bodie's death, Taylor has not made enough headway on the claim to strike it rich. And as fate would have it, he never will. E.S. Taylor was attacked by a band of Paiute Indians. He was scalped and beheaded. Such a gruesome death was obviously the result of a lot of hostility in the area. The people who killed E.S. Taylor definitely wanted to send a message by scalping him. And there may have been hostility towards another American Indian helping the miners. They didn't care for the land. They cared for the gold. And because of that, a lot of hard feelings were created. Even though the circumstances around his murder will never be fully known, Taylor's bizarre death still raises questions and many wonder if perhaps it is the work of his old partner. The old story is that Bodie from his grave wanted revenge on Taylor. And that the legend of the Bodie curse begins with the demise of E.S. Taylor. And it doesn't stop with his double-crossing partner. W.S. Bodie holds a grudge against anyone who takes something that is rightfully his. box back. Haven't opened it yet. And as usual, here's the letter. I'm returning this back to Bodie State Park where it should have stayed in the first place. We visit on August 5th. August 7th, 8th, and 9th, extreme sinus infection. I had to get Demerol shot. August 14th, my oldest son dropped the ball on my foot by accident. It cut me. My nine-year-old daughter was stung on the foot by a red ant. My apology and I will continue to visit Bodhi once returning back to California. So we have a typical return, uh, glass pieces, pieces of iron, a lot of glass actually. 
Everyone's experience with the curse is different. Some more frightening than others. But one thing remains the same. They experience some strange uh, phenomena uh, when they leave the park, whether it's, it's the same day or next week or years later. But over a hundred years ago, W.S. Bodie's curse had only struck his old partner, E.S. Taylor. That is, until the mother load is found on Bodie's claim. In 1875, the major source of gold was discovered on Bodie Bluff, and there was uh, a good amount of gold found there. And once the discovery is made, it doesn't take long for word to spread. By 1877, the boom was on, and it became one of the fastest growing towns in California at the time. The rapidly growing town is named Bodie after the fallen miner, and its raucous reputation hints at his curse. Main Street was a mile long in its heyday. It was famed for strong drink, hard work, and guns. Miners worked 12 hours a day, and they were working really hard down in very dark conditions. And when they came out, you bet, they were probably on their way to have themselves a drink or two. Any typical mining town is going to have saloons and women, and Bodie certainly had its share of both. It was the nature of the beast, the nature of the men, and the types of things that went on in a mining camp. There were weeks where there were one to two shootings a week, and maybe more. What you got there, fella? My claim. You just take it easy now. With this kind of reputation, it seems the spirit of W.S. Bodie is back to his old tricks. Cursing the people who steal from him. But that's not the only reason people in Bodie suffer. There was a lot of people that died from weather conditions because they weren't expecting the frigid winter temperatures. There's only about 30 days out of the year that we do not freeze, even today. There were stories of men sleeping in saloons, walking out to their work and getting lost in the snow and finding them when the blizzard was over. Easy to lose your way. The conditions keep everyone on their toes at all times. But there's one thing that their vigilance can't help. After just a few years, the gold in Bodie becomes elusive and difficult to retrieve. The veins never completely dried up, but it got more expensive the deeper they went, and it wasn't profitable to bring it out. Perhaps once again, W.S. Bodie is hard at work protecting his claim. Maybe Bodie's a ghost town because of all the gold that was taken out of it. There are other, other mining camps in the area that are still living. Virginia City is an example. They're still taking ore out of, out of that place. And without its gold, the town of Bodie is nothing. As quickly as Bodie grew, it probably declined even faster. The mass exodus in Bodie came in between 83 and 90. You had 8,000 and 5,000 people, and then it dwindled down to a couple of hundred. Folks leave in such a hurry to get away from the horrific weather conditions, they don't even bother to move their things. And while the Bodie of today is just a hint of what it used to be, some things remain, like the legend that protects this town and its legacy. The Bodie curse seems to be alive and well. And nowadays, with all the trinkets lying around, a lot of visitors have a hard time resisting the urge to test the spirit of Bodhi. We do mention the curse in that there have been many people affected. We do try to help people understand, leave it alone, leave it where it lay. But if someone decides to tempt fate, the curse always gets the last word. A recent visitor to the park found this out the hard way. I just wanted it to stop because it was like boom, 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 one after another. And her first-hand encounter is so convincing that the legend of the curse can't be questioned. I was sure that if we didn't find a way to break the Bodhi curse that we may possibly all have died.
Once a raucous boomtown, Bodie now sits in a state of arrested decay. But even though it's a ghost town, there's still a lot of action around these parts, especially when it comes to the curse put on this land centuries ago. Last time when I was at Bodie, one of my friends snuck a bottle in the back seat of the car. I had realized I was halfway home. I turned right back around to return it because I did not want that curse on me. People are smart to be scared of the curse because once it's in effect, there's no telling what bad luck will come. I believe the curse affects people differently depending on where they are in their own lives and, and maybe the lessons they need to learn. Carissa Gardner, a no-nonsense mother of three, didn't think she had much left to learn. That is, until she pays a visit to the ghost town. It just seemed like something different and neat to do with the kids over the summer. I read about the curse, and I told my husband and my children before we even drove to Bodie, don't take rocks, don't take anything you see on the ground, don't take anything. The curse of Bodie, he's coming to get you. Yeah. Better run. <laughs> I do not believe in curses, and I'm not superstitious, but I didn't want to invite anything bad or evil or cursed into my life just in case it existed. My kids did not take anything from Bodie because <laughs> I threatened their life. We stayed almost all day and as we were leaving the park we were super tired and I started getting a little, you know, tweak in my back. I just figured I'd wake up and be fine the next day. Well, my back pain did get worse, and I had to make an appointment with the back doctor. And he had checked me out, and I had a disc auto rotation. He made an appointment for me to come in to get a full adjustment, and he prescribed me two Valium. He wanted me to be totally relaxed when I came in the next day. All night long, I was jittery. I felt tense, which made my back feel worse. I couldn't sleep. I was miserable. And when I woke up, my eyeballs hurt so bad. I mean, I wanted to scrape them out. So my husband drove me to the emergency room here in my town, and they told me that one in 2,000 people have the opposite reaction to Valium, and that's what happened to me. Carissa recovers from her Valium reaction, what? and her back is soon on the mend. But this is just the beginning of her torment. Shortly after, one of her sons accidentally stabs himself with his brother's allergy shot. It went completely through. I was freaking out, and his adrenaline was super high because he had the epinephrine in him. He's screaming, that I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, and I'm gonna die. It was really scary because it's to use on somebody in a dire situation, like if my oldest son was having an asthma attack and here my youngest just was playing with it and stabbed himself. Carissa and her family make another trip to the ER. Thankfully, the medicine was not released into his hand, so her son is fine. I found out the night after we got back from the emergency room that my husband had some colored glass from Bodie. You just took that from me? Oh, At that point, I knew it was the curse. I wanted to send the glass back. I just wanted it to stop. But the curse was not over yet. Later on, my daughter was climbing the backyard tree, and she went to grab for a branch, and she missed. <laughs> I didn't even second guess it once. I was just like, I already knew. I just knew she broke her arm. Honey. We went to the hospital and she broke her upper humerus. We made three trips to the ER within a 10 day period. At that point I knew that I had to do whatever it would take to send that glass back. I did not want to wait around and find out what happened next. I just thought that if I got rid of the stuff and send it back where it belonged, it would stop. And after that, our lives did get back to normal. I didn't have any problems at all. It just stopped. While some actively defy the curse of Bodhi, 
Most folks have no interest in putting the infamous curse to the test. We certainly have a lot of people that will not take any chances. They're concerned if they have rocks in their shoes. When I leave Bodie, I even dust my shoes off so I don't take any dirt from Bodie. While the town's founder, W.S. Bodie, gets credit for the curse, it's also been suggested that some other former residents of the rowdy boomtown work together to protect what once was theirs. I think it's a collective spiritual thing because, you know, there were a lot of people that were in and out of that place. And I don't think any of them want Bodie to walk away. And it's been rumored that these spirits are sometimes found roaming the abandoned streets of Bodie. We have had uh, several circumstances through the years where people have reported hearing things, seeing things, feeling things. And the spirits don't always play nice. She was pushed from behind, actually fell on her hands on the staircase. Best known as a ghost town high in the Sierra Nevada mountains, the history of Bodie, California is full of alluring stories. And the curse set upon the land by W.S. Bodie is just one of them. It's also been said that this town is haunted by former residents from the gold rush. Is Bodie haunted? You know, I don't know. Um, it is really creepy up there, though. You know, one time when I was up there, I met this guy, and he was telling me a story about him and his wife were over at the schoolhouse, and they heard children, like, running and playing, and, and they went to go talk to the park ranger, and then said, hey, are there kids here? And they're like, no, there aren't any kids here. In fact, you two are the only couple uh, at the park right now. I definitely think that ghosts and presences do exist up at Bodie, just from the strong feeling that you get when you're in the area. You can definitely feel the energy of all the people that have been there. If you're sensitive about energies uh, and you walk through the town, you'll feel them. There are spirits there. Um, plenty of people died in Bodie. And for some, their experience with the spirits of Bodie have been more than just a feeling. There's been a lot of people that had experiences on and off through the years. Most common are the phenomena would be footsteps, footsteps in the back of the buildings when there's nobody there, or uh, music coming out of the buildings. I have actually heard music twice. These playful brushes with the other world are usually harmless. However, there have been a few times when the spirits of Bodhi have been known to get a little rough. We had a prominent Bodhi fundraiser who was visiting Bodhi, and she was on her way upstairs in the cane house. And she was pushed from behind, actually fell on her hands on the staircase. Perhaps it was the legendary Bodhi wind that nudged this visitor up the stairs, but she felt otherwise and didn't want to take any chances. She said out loud that she was only visiting, that she wouldn't stay. She left the house unscathed, but the experience scared the woman enough to make good on her promise. About a year later, she was invited to stay overnight with me in the house because we were having a big event, and she kind of laughed at me and said, are you kidding, I'll, I'll never go in that house again. Such encounters with the afterlife are just one more of this former boomtown's many mysterious traits. And it turns out, this enigmatic history has come in handy. I believe the curse protects the town because it raises awareness of why we need to leave things alone. We certainly use the experience of the curse to try to prevent people from thinking that they should pick up stuff and take. I think one of the most interesting things about the legend of Bodhi is its practical application. For all of its supernatural trappings, it has a very mundane moral, which is don't take things that don't belong to you. Many legends, the moral and the value system, you know, it's just a little below the surface. 
this one's just right on the surface. You really can't miss it. But there is only so much the curse can do for Bodhi. The extreme elements on this side of the mountain threaten to wipe this cherished relic off the map for good. It is surprising to me that there are so many buildings left standing today in Bodhi. With all of the harsh weather that comes through during the summer, you have extreme heat and drying. During the winter, you have extreme snowfall, a lot of snowfall accumulation with 20-foot drifts and cold temperatures. And then put into that the hurricane force gusts in excess of 90 to 100 miles per hour. Those buildings shouldn't be standing there today. But everyone works hard to keep Bodhi as it is. And there is a good reason why. There is an essence in Bodhi that you will feel nowhere else. It's the old buildings that are creaking in the wind. It's the dust that's accumulated inside. It's so special and it's, it's unique. There's, there's no place like Bodhi. There's no place. Bodhi is definitely part of our American history. There are so many stories of Bodhi and so many uh, points of history that are intertwined with it. There's something spiritual about the place to me. The Bodhi experience is different for everyone who visits this sacred place. Most are just happy to wonder at its deteriorating beauty and the story that it tells. Bodhi needs to live in your memory and in your heart not in your possession. While others can't resist the urge to test a centuries-old scourge and pay dearly for their curiosity. You really do need to obey the rules. Don't, don't tempt the curse. Leave Bodhi together in one piece and, uh, and you'll be okay. But even if one does escape the curse of Bodhi and the town's many restless spirits, they still have to contend with the mysterious and powerful elements that strike at a moment's notice, leaving one to wonder if perhaps the weather will have the last word in the sordid history of this little mountain town.